Hi, I'm Mariah Richas and I'm a researcher at Leuphana University in Lüneburg, Germany, in the Faculty of Sustainability. I do not need to tell you about the current state of our Earth. I'm sure you are aware of the dramatic changes in our climate due to our emissions or the drastic amount of use and conversion of land for human purposes and the influence this has on ecosystems. Even we as people experience rapid changes due to new technologies, our focus on economic growth, for example, and enhanced communications. We currently live in the Anthropocene, an epoch in which human activities have grown to become significant geological forces, which may have started about two centuries ago, coinciding with James Watt's design of the steam engine in 1776. The Anthropocene is defined by the Great Acceleration, social, economic and environmental trends that are exponentially increasing from population or GDP and tourism to carbon dioxide, surface temperature and loss of tropical forest. We already surpassed our planetary boundaries, using up our Earth resources and causing a sixth mass extinction event on the way. None of this information is particularly new though, right? Since at least the 1960s, we have had an environmental movement fueled by the book of Rachel Carson called Silent Spring, culminating in The Limits to Growth, published by the Club of Rome. The Limits to Growth was published in 1972, the year the United Nations Environmental Programme was created. So we have known about this accelerating trends of our unsustainability back then, and we know about those trends now. Yet, in the 50 years since the limits of growth, what has really changed? We often shy away from asking fundamental questions about human behavior. They're seen often as ideological or difficult to tackle, but we do have to ask them because our interventions to foster a sustainable earth so far have not been very effective. Despite all of our work and effort as sustainability scientists, the trends shown in the Great Acceleration, they remain and the challenges and its impacts grow every passing year. We know, as one example, that the climate is changing. We know the general trajectory, and we have known it since the 1970s. The only thing that is changing is the amount of detail about the possible outcome, but we haven't managed to stop moving along this trajectory. Many of our interventions are treating symptoms, not causes. Interventions are often technical adjustments rather than systemic changes. They are reinforcing or at least accepting the systems rather than changing them. As Barack Obama wrote, what's troubling is the gap between the magnitude of our challenges and the smallness of our politics. This sustainability gap is ever increasing because we focus on short-term pragmatism instead of focusing on the root causes of our sustainability problems. Donella Meadows, one of the authors of The Limits to Growth, back in 1972, was frustrated about this ineffectiveness of interventions just as much as we are now. So she came up with the idea of leverage points. Leverage points are places to intervene in a system where minor interventions can lead to relatively major changes. Meadows identified a hierarchy of increasingly effective leverage points on a scale from 1 to 12. Existing sustainability interventions such as green taxes, biodiversity conventions or the greening of the cap reform, etc. appear to be failing to shift the current unsustainable development trajectories. Yet, such minor reforms are relatively easy to do and relatively easy to engage with for us as researchers. That's why they are preferred by politicians and by researchers. The outcome might be more straightforward, the questions easier to ask, the methods already available. But interventions at deep leverage points, which may actually bring about transformational change, are much, much harder to understand or carry out. The goals of the system or systematic structures and how to change them is more difficult to tackle. Colleagues of mine classified the leverage points by Meadows into four domains. Parameters, feedbacks, design and intent. Design and intent of the system being the deeper leverage points that could foster a more transformative change. This is by no means to say that shallow leverage points per se should be neglected. They have a place in transformation, yet we should aim increasingly to also focus on deeper leverage points 
and their interplay with the Shilo ones. For example, a friend of mine found in her research in Ethiopia that changing a quota for women in certain areas increased the number of women in those areas, a cello leverage point, because the amount of women changed. But it likewise started to change the attitude of society about the role of women, a deep leverage point. So links between shallow and deep leverage points can be crucial not just to understand systems, but also to foster transformation. We have been working with the leverage points perspective for a while now and consider it to be very helpful for our research. We see four advantages. It helps us to focus on the influential and deep leverage points, but it also helps us to emphasize and address the links between shallow and deep ones. Further, the leverage points perspective helps us to bridge causal and teleological explanations for system change, how change arises from variables interacting with each other, but also how human intent shapes the trajectory of a system. Leverage points can also be a methodological boundary object, an entry point for practitioners to work with you, for different academic disciplines to work together towards the goal of finding a more influential intervention. We found this very helpful. Maybe it can also help your work. Links to the papers referenced in this video are linked below. Thank you.